Okay, welcome back everyone for this session too. It was an amazing and insightful first lecture and a very uh, dynamic uh, question and answer time. Uh, before I was talking about interfaith dialogue, we were in different faith traditions, particularly the Abrahamic traditions. But here today we have a dialogue between a secular philosophy of ethics and hosted at a, some sort of a religious institute. But we have a very common goal, uh, and that is to end animal suffering. And uh, I found it very actually spiritual. Even the vegan food, I must admit, I feel more spiritual. In the Islamic understanding, eating meat kills spirituality due to various narrations. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was even narrated to have a camel came up to him complaining about the overburdening of it by its owner. And then the Prophet confronts the owner, says, the camel informs me you're putting too much weight on it and you intend to kill it. Is this true? And the young man from Medina, he confirms that it's true and he says, fear God in your treatment of animals. And one of our local scholars reminded me just before that uh, there's a hadith tradition that also says a woman will be admitted to paradise purely because how she treats a cat, her treatment of a cat. So some of us may be mo motivated by otherworldly intentions. Some of us may be mot motivated by purely ending the suffering. Regardless, we have a lot of more common goals. And so I'll call upon uh, Dr. Peter Singer again to continue on his second talk, speaking about the ethics of what we eat. And then that will be followed by a shorter, perhaps, question and answers, uh, again from online and on site. Okay, welcome, Dr. Singer. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, say we're moving on to the more practical question of the ethics of what we eat, where we all have a potential impact on uh, the treatment of animals. So let me look at this. So as I briefly mentioned previously, I think what we eat is the biggest of the animal issues in terms of what we humans do to animals. Let's just look at the figures for this. So. Let's, we're talking here about vertebrate animals only. Um, in terms of research, we don't really have very good figures uh, for the total. And one reason why we don't have very good figures is the bizarre law in this country, which um, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture, its Bureau of Animal Welfare, which regulates research on animals, actually is only empowered by Congress to deal with um, a very select group of animals, um, dogs, cats, primates, a few others, but not uh, rats, mice, or birds. And in fact, um, rats and mice make up at least 95% of all the animals used in research in this country. So there are accurate statistics on the other maybe 5%, we don't really know, maybe even less than 5% according to one study uh, of animals. Um, and that's one reason why we don't know the real number. Um, and China, which is the other big nation in terms of animal experimentation, also, w there are some surveys, but there are no official stats. But let's say roughly 200 million. Now, you might think that's quite a lot of animals, after all. But compare it with the food issue, um, and it's one thousandth of that, right? 200 billion vertebrate animals raised and killed for food each year. The largest proportion of that, actually, slightly over half, are fish, because aquaculture has boomed in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, particularly in Asia. So a lot of these uh, animals are fish being raised for food in China. Um, but they're also very crowded, and as I said, they're also capable of suffering. Uh, and um, even if we just talked about land animals, um, we would be something like 80 billion and uh, the majority of them would be chickens. Uh, the United States alone produces something like nine billion chickens uh, for meat every year. So, um, as I say, a thousand times more um, than uh, we, with other ones. And by the way, I'm only talking about farmed animals. I'm not talking about the wild caught fish, which would make the numbers um, much higher again if we included them. Okay, so let's look at what 
how animals are reared. As I said, chickens are the largest number of um, vertebrate land animals produced uh, for food. And um, this is the standard method of keeping chickens uh, in a huge shed or almost like an uh, aircraft hangar with perhaps uh, 20,000 birds in each shed. Um, and uh, particularly by the time they get to be sort of ready for market and fully grown, uh, extremely crowded. Um, i give you another shot. Here's another shot looking down on them. Um, and you see how crowded they are here as well. Also, you get a better sense here of how they're fed. Um, these are uh, essentially pipes that are distributing food and water to the birds. Um, now, the quote at the bottom is from Professor John Webster, who's an eminent veterinarian who has made his career in research into the welfare of farmed animals. And he established a center for animal welfare at the University of Bristol, which um, is the largest or perhaps the second largest uh, center for the study of animal welfare in Europe. So he's a, a real authority on animal welfare. Now why is he saying that chicken raising is the single most severe systematic example of man's inhumanity to another sentient animal? It's not just because they're crowded, although that's certainly part of it, and it's not just because the numbers are so huge, although that's also part of it. But it's also because these birds have been selectively bred to put on weight very, very fast. The faster you can fatten up your chickens and get them to the market weight, the cheaper that they are, so the more money you will make, and you're in competition with other people who are trying to do this. So if you don't do it, um, you will lose out on the competition. So then, what's the problem with having chickens growing so fast? One problem is that they put on weight so quickly that they're very immature, um, but very large. So when they are sold, when the chicken you see in a supermarket was killed at about six weeks of age. Um, but at that age, its leg bones are still quite immature. They have not really strengthened. And yet, this bird weighs as much as uh, in you know, the more traditional farming 50 years ago, um, weighs as much as a bird twice its age uh, would have weighed. So um, this means uh, sometimes that the legs actually completely collapse under the chicken. Um, and here you can see a chicken with whom this has happened. This is not the way a chicken would normally be sitting down. She's got her legs splayed out in front. Um, the legs have collapsed and that bird is now unable to move. So what does that mean? Well, you look at the shed like this, nobody is going to look at individual chickens. Um, you know, a, a worker will maybe walk through the shed once a day um, and pick up any corpses, but um, there's not really um, any individual care at all. And if that bird that you saw was um, you know, in the middle of, let's say, this group, uh, that bird could not get to the food or water, so um, its fate would be to, to die of thirst or, or starvation, and then eventually, the, as I say, the corpse would be picked up and taken away. So this is um, what Webster is, is talking about, the fact that when the birds are standing before their legs do collapse, they're actually in pain. Webster compares it with forcing somebody with uh, severe arthritis in their legs to stand up all day. Uh, you might say, well, why do the hens stand up? Why don't they sit down? Maybe not in this position, but why don't they sit down in the way they'd like to sit down on this, uh, this is kind of called litter. This <coughs> could be wood shavings, could be sawdust, whatever it might be that is on the floor of the shed. Well, the reason they don't sit down on it is because it is full of bird droppings. Um, not only their bird droppings during the six weeks they've been alive, but um, maybe a whole year's worth of bird droppings because it hasn't been cleaned out for a year, which would be perfectly standard in the industry. You don't replace it after each group of birds. And bird droppings are alkaline, strongly alkaline. So if an, uh, uh, the bird droppings uh, get moist and the atmosphere can be moist with all the crowding of, of the birds, um, it um, produces an alkaline 
substance that actually causes a skin burn. Like you get something very caustic on your skin, it'll burn it. And if the birds sit down for a long time on the litter, uh, they get burns on their, on their hocks, on their, on their legs. Uh, so, they, so they can't really comfortably do that. Either they have to stand, but um, that is also distressing for them. Okay, let's, I talked about these wire cages before um, when talking about the egg-laying hens. These are the standard laying cages. Uh, they're also very crowded, as you can see. Um, the, uh, the bird droppings, in this case, just fall onto the shed below, um, onto the row of cages below. Uh, the eggs roll down and, and uh, collected there. So it's a labour-saving system, but it's a completely miserable system for the birds. And as a result of the uh, crowding, they lose a lot of their feathers. So you see how uh, the, the birds, the hen's skin here is, is rubbed raw um, by rubbing either against other birds or perhaps more likely against the wire. Um, so she's probably sore um, there from the skin. Uh, and um, you see here a bird at the end of lay. So this is, you know, the the very lucky one in a, a million um, bird who was rescued by an animal organization and um, put out on grass by this organization which was then called Compassion Over Killing. Um, it's now got a different name which I've forgotten. Um, but um, the interesting thing is that when you, if you do rescue a bird uh, at the end of her lay, a bird who has never been outside in all of her life, um, uh, so firstly, as you see, she's lost a lot of feathers and hasn't got much and uh, her skin is raw where it's exposed. But the other thing is she very quickly is off chasing butterflies or bugs. Um, she's looking for food around there. She's, of course, stretching her wings. And when she finds a bit of dirt, um, she will dust bathe. Um, it's an instinct in hens. And you've, if you've seen backyard hens, you'll have seen it. Um, they get a bit of dirt, they, they create a little hollow and they fluff up the dust around their wings. Um, one theory is it's a way of controlling parasites. Uh, we don't really know, but it's certainly an instinct that birds who've never had the opportunity to do it um, will do it when they're released from captivity. <coughs> Let's move to pigs. Um, so um, these are uh, pigs being reared for, for market um, and again you can see that they're very crowded, they're in group pens here but quite small pens all the same. Uh, again there will probably be some bullying as there was um, with the hens in their cages. But even worse than the conditions of these pigs um, is the conditions of their mothers. These are the breeding sows um, who uh, kept um, still, you know, again this is one of the things as I said earlier, the, the cages you saw for the laying hens are illegal in Europe. They have to have a lot more space than that. Um, and the, uh, these stalls for sows are illegal in Europe as well. Um, so these stalls are so narrow, as you can see, that the, the sows can't even turn around in them. All they can do is stand up or lie down. Um, you can also see that they are lying on bare metal slats. There's no straw or bedding of any kind. Um, that's again labor saving. If you had straw you would have to change it now and again. Um, this way you don't do anything, you just hose down the pig and the slats and the manure will wash through. Um, and that uh, saves labor costs but it's clearly less comfortable for the pigs. Um, and the lameness of the pig's legs is a big problem with this system. Um, so uh, you know, the, here are these highly intelligent animals, as I said, they have nothing to do all day except stand up, lie down, um, and they will get fed and they will consume their food in a relatively short time, um, and, uh, and that's their lives. One other factor that you don't actually see, and I should say this applies to the chickens as well, the pigs, like the chickens, the pigs have been bred to eat a lot and put on weight fast. Um, that's the pigs you saw before for market and the chickens who are being raised for meat. Okay, but how are they bred to do that? Obviously they're genetically selected, but that means that their parents have the same genes as they do. But if you fed, so you, so you have 
breeding birds, and here the breeding sows, um, and uh, you have them with, with the same genes to eat a lot very rapidly, be very hungry. Um, but if you allowed the breeding birds and the breeding pigs to eat as much as they want, if you fed them like the ones you're going to sell for market, um, who you give as much food as they want because you want them to grow fast, um, if you did that, they would either die before they reach sexual maturity because they would be so overweight, um, or uh, they would be unable actually to mate. Certainly in the case of the, of the chickens, um, the rooster simply could not sexually connect with the, uh, with the hen. Um, so these animals are essentially kept on semi-starvation rations their entire life. They are not given all the food they want. In the chicken industry, the breeding birds are typically fed on what's called a skip-a-day system, which means you only feed them every second day. So you have birds bred to eat a lot, to be hungry, and every second day they have no food at all. Um, they look around for food, they look around for any m lost grain of food that maybe got overlooked, um, but uh, essentially there's nothing to eat and that's an additional cause of, of distress for them. When the uh, sow is ready to give birth, she is not free, even in those circumstances. She is uh, put in what's called a farrowing crate. Um, one way in which we distance ourselves from animals often is by using different terms. So whereas our, uh, women in our society may go into a birthing unit, pigs don't go into a birthing crate, they go into a farrowing crate. Um, we don't say they're pregnant, we say they're gestating. Um, a whole lot of separate terms for animals to distinguish what they're doing from us. So in this farrowing crate, um, here are the piglets. She's basically now a milk machine for the piglets. Um, she can't really move, she can't comfort them, she can't uh, move them around. She's just lying on her side with her teats exposed so the piglets can um, drink from them. And fairly soon, long before in a natural system, the pigs are, are taken away from her um, and uh, then put in those units you saw before. Um, and she is not given an opportunity for any maternal contact with them. If she were in a different system, or if she were in the forest, as pigs are naturally forest animals, she would actually, before she gives birth, she would start to prepare a nest. Um, pigs in a forest get leaves and twigs and things and make a comfortable area for them to lie down and give birth. And then she would give birth in the nest. Um, she would be able to move around. She would be able to look after the piglets um, and make sure that they're okay. Um, and they would be with her for... Um, several weeks um, before they were weaned and she would then live with them and move around with them for uh, quite a long time afterwards. Uh, but she's put in this system because she's still on the metal slats as you can see um, and it prevents her lying on top of her piglets without the opportunity to build a proper nest or straw. Um, she might lie on some of the piglets and crush them um, and since her role is to produce as many piglets as possible the producer doesn't want her to do that. Let's move to cows. Um, cows are somewhat better off than either chickens or pigs in terms of industrial cow production because they're typically not indoors, but they are in these immense feedlots, as you see here. Um, uh, still by you know, cow standards, a lot of cows in a small area, um, the, the feedlots are separated, they're, they're fenced, and if you can see there, so there's maybe a group of 30 or 40 in each group. Um, and the reason they're brought here, um, they, they, they were on grass before when they were shortly after they were born. They're brought here to be fed on uh, grain, typically corn in this country, wheat in some other countries, also maybe soy um, and sometimes some fish meal added too. Um, it makes them put on weight faster um, and it also makes their meat fattier. So um, f the meat that is marbled, that has marbled thin veins of fat running through it, um, uh, people find tastier and uh, that's another reason for feeding them on grain. Uh, their digestion is not really suited for grain. It's extremely wasteful. I'll get to that later in terms of the food value. Uh, but it does 
um, pay commercially. Uh, also, as you can see here, um, there is no shade or shelter of any kind. Now, I think this feedlot is in Colorado, where that's probably more of a problem in winter because it's fairly high and there's no protection from blizzards and snowstorms. In, uh, but in summer, and certainly in places further south like Texas, um, it's a problem from, of heat in summer. Um, and it happened in this summer that quite a number of feedlots lost cows from heat stroke. So why don't they provide shade? There's actually a study that I quote in Animal Liberation Now carried out by agricultural economists which looks into this question and it acknowledges that if you do provide shade uh, fewer of your cows will die from heat stroke. Pretty obvious. But it also says whether this pays economically essentially depends on the price of beef at the time. So in times when beef prices are, are not uh, particularly high it's the cost of putting up the shade is greater than the loss of um, the cattle. So that's why it's, it's typically still not done. It's purely an economic calculation. The welfare of the animals doesn't really come into it. Now, turkeys. I was talking to uh, Cheryl about uh, turkeys um, uh, during the break. Um, the uh, Thanksgiving turkey is also uh, overwhelmingly factory farmed, uh, I don't know, 99 point something percent of um, turkeys, American turkeys will be factory farmed. It's a rather similar system to chickens in terms of their housing. Um, again, they'll be in a huge shed. Um, again, they'll be extremely crowded. Um, and they've also been mutilated. They, the turkeys have a thing called a snood, a little bit of red flesh, um, which does also attract pecking. And so that's removed um, from the standard turkeys. But there's one other difference um, about uh, turkeys from chickens. I said before that if you let the breeding birds um, eat as much as they like with chickens, they wouldn't be able to mate. Well, turkeys, uh, as you may know, have been deliberately bred not just to grow fast, but to have a huge breast because everybody wants a slice of the turkey breast. And the result of having a huge breast is again, it's not physically possible for turkeys to mate. So how is it that there are so many turkeys when they can't mate? Here's the answer. Every one of these standard butterball type turkeys is the result of artificial insemination. So about 20 years ago, um, I uh, co-authored with a friend called Jim Mason uh, a book called The Ethics of What We Eat. Um, and Jim, who was, uh, had grown up on a farm, um, wanted to find out what it was like to work as a turkey inseminator. So um, he applied for a, a job with a turkey inseminator. No questions were asked uh, except that he had to do a drug test. But um, passing the drug test, they were happy to hire him. Um, they have a very high turnover. And the reason they have a very high turnover is that Jim described it as the hardest, dirtiest, a uh, worst day's work he had ever had to do. Um, and he only worked for one day because he only wanted to find out what it was like. So um, this is the second stage of the insemination here. Firstly, in, in a different area, the, uh, the breeding males have been kept and uh, there is somebody whose job it is to masturbate the male turkeys and collect the semen in a tube. Um, then when the tubes uh, fill up, they are taken down to where the uh, turkey hens are um, and here you see the worker uh, squirting with a kind of air gun thing the semen into the female turkeys. Now this happens to the female turkeys regularly, right? They, they are fertilized, they produce the fertile eggs um, and then it's done to them again. So they know what's going to happen and they do not like it. They resist as much as they can. That's one reason why Jim found it so difficult because the turkeys are big heavy birds. They're struggling not to have this done to them um, but nevertheless you have to do it and if you don't do it fast enough the uh, supervisor um, balls you out for uh, not working quickly enough on the job. So um, 
you know, if you think about the, the family turkey at, at Thanksgiving, I, t I, I talk to my students about this and I suggest that um, if they are going to have a turkey at Thanksgiving, they could talk to their family about the way the turkey actually came into existence. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, the majority of animals, actually vertebrate animals raised for food worldwide, uh, not land-based animals but fish, um, and industrial fish production is also um, horrendously uh, crowded conditions for the fish um, with even less attention given to them if that's possible as individuals than the chickens. Um, uh, somehow people are even less concerned about the suffering of fish, maybe because they can't vocalize, maybe because they're, they're cold and slimy and um, uh, not warm-blooded, uh, I don't know. But um, there's also no humane slaughter for the fish. Uh, humane slaughter for chickens is a, uh, sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Again, it's a very high-speed process which has a lot of misses, but um, it isn't even really attempted for fish. Uh, they are killed in ways that um, are typically going to cause them uh, pain without any kind of pre-stunning or anything of that sort. Okay, now actually th there are quite a few f people I know who say, um, you know, when I talk to them or when they know of my interest in animals, they say, oh, I don't eat animals, I only eat fish. Um, I don't think this is an advantage. In fact, if you really want to minimize animal suffering, um, I would say stop eating fish, eat cows instead. Um, for a number of reasons. One is, of course, cows are much bigger and so there's only one sentient being suffering for feeding a lot of meals, a lot of people, whereas with fish um, there are far more sentient beings suffering with uh, uh, the meals that people are eating. Secondly, um, particularly if you eat carnivorous fish, and, and certainly in America this is not necessarily true in every part of the world, but certainly in America, you know, I go to events where um, people say, oh well, um, yeah, we're providing vegan food for you and we're providing fish for, the, for other people who want it. Um, and the fish is mostly salmon. Uh, maybe this is a Princeton thing where Princeton can afford the salmon and not everybody can. But um, it's certainly a popular uh, fish here. Um, and salmon are carn carnivorous. And um, these salmon produced by caterers are all going to be factory farm salmon. They're not going to be wild caught salmon. They're um, more expensive and they're a minority of salmon production now. And they therefore have to be fed on uh, fish that are, who are caught from the oceans and ground up and made into fish pellets. And as I say, this one study that I, that I cite um, suggests that for one salmon um, that has reached uh, market weight, this is in four kilos, maybe eight pounds, um, 147 fish have been uh, killed uh, in order to produce it. So a lot, a lot of more suffering than you actually see. The salmon suffering is bad enough. Uh, salmon, after all, are fish who in nature would swim across the oceans and then return to breed to the stream where they were reared. These salmon are swimming endlessly round and round in, in nets in the fish farms. Um, but apart from that, there's all of the suffering of those other fish who admittedly had didn't went farmed and so their lives were natural but again they all died in ways that caused them uh, suffering because there's no humane uh, slaughter for, for fish. Um, so that's why I say to people um, if, you're going to, if, if you're going to eat some animal uh, meat or flesh um, choose, a, choose a different animal than certainly than carnivorous fish. Okay, um, and here's the, the, just to show you the, um, the wild animal killing, there are many different methods of catching and killing wild animals, but one of the ones that is responsible for a lot of uh, commercial fish uh, catching is uh, using these enormous nets, trawlers towing these huge nets uh, behind them. And as you see with the net here, um, this is full of fish, so full of fish, and there's so much pressure on the fish that some of the fish, if you can see on the top, actually getting sort of squeezed through the holes in the net. Um, maybe they've been killed by being squeezed through, maybe they're still alive. Uh, it'll vary, but um, 
the, the net is then going to be hauled up onto the uh, ship. There will be even more pressure as the net comes out of the water and the sheer weight of the fish crushes other fish below them. Um, and then it will be uh, emptied out into the hold of the ship and if in fact the fish are still alive, if they haven't been crushed, they will then suffocate in the air. So uh, there's a lot of suffering in fish and there's also of course a lot of problems with overfishing the oceans with the ocean uh, not being, fisheries not being sustainable and also with uh, fisheries near uh, poorer countries, low income countries for example um, a lot of fisheries off the coast of West Africa um, by having these huge trawlers catching fish and using it for um, either feeding animals uh, or uh, eating themselves in affluent countries it means that uh, what used to be fisheries that kept the coastal villages alive and gave them adequate protein um, no longer feed them. And one of the reasons why there are so many African immigrants desperate to cross the Mediterranean and get into Europe is that uh, their fisheries have been um, exploited by the European uh, trawlers and um, there's no longer fish there for them. Okay, so I just want to say a little bit about the um, environmental impact uh, particularly of meat and dairy production because I think that's an additional, if we're talking about the ethics of what we eat, it's not only about the concern for animals, um, although that was what turned me away from eating animals um, more than 50 years ago, but um, there is also a significant environmental impact. So what you're seeing here is um, a... Uh, a pig producing um, unit uh, with these sheds and um, the manure from the from the sheds I showed you the slats and gets hosed down and then it goes into this pond which is euphemistically called a lagoon um, when I was a kid lagoon conjured up this image of the sparkling blue water around a tropical island with a coral reef on the edge of it um, this lagoon is basically a cesspool, um, it's full of um, stinking manure um, in the water there and the idea is that eventually this will get um, pumped out and sprayed on fields um, as a fertilizer but there are many problems with it. One is every now and again there will be a so-called once in a century uh, rainfall and the lagoon will flood and overflow its banks or the banks will collapse and the water will flow into the rivers uh, wherever it is and that will kill millions of fish in the rivers and pollute the rivers so that uh, rivers that older people say oh we used to swim in that river you wouldn't think of going near it now because it stinks um, so that's damaged the uh, water pollution of a lot of this country there's also air pollution if you happen to be unfortunate enough to live close to one of these places and the wind blows from the place to you um, the stink can be overwhelming. Uh, so that's that. But then there is also the climate change effect of this. So this is a statement that was issued after the Paris Agreement on Climate Change in 2015, um, which uh, was an agreement that was supposed to avoid exceeding global warming of 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, and this statement from... Um, uh, it's actually called the Royal Institute for International Affairs, uh, known as Chatham House, um, says that even if we reduce um, emissions from the livestock production, the sector will consume a growing share of the remaining carbon budget. This will make it extremely difficult to realise the goal of limiting the average global temperature rise to two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, so even if we, if we phase out fossil fuels too, and replace them with uh, green electricity, which we certainly haven't yet done by any means. But still, if meat consumption continues, uh, we will be adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Um, uh, some people say, oh, well, I only eat grass-fed beef, um, which may be better from an animal welfare point of view, but it's not better from a greenhouse point of view because, in fact, uh, grass-fed beef per kilo or per pound has, uh, is responsible for more 
greenhouse gas emissions than feedlot beef. Why is that? Well, as I said, the reason for feeding uh, animals on grain is that uh, they grow faster, they put on weight faster. Um, but they're producing methane, a very potent greenhouse gas, um, as they digest. So if they're on grass, it takes longer for them to reach market weight, um, and therefore there's more time during which they're producing methane and releasing it into the atmosphere. So um, as this uh, study suggests, um, it's actually worse from a, green, uh, a climate point of view to be eating grass-fed beef than it is to be eating uh, feedlot beef. Um, another thing that people sometimes say about factory farming that I've been showing is that despite all the disadvantages which people will admit, we have a growing world population and we need to feed them. Well, there's a few things that can be said about this. One is that in fact uh, industrial farming, factory farming, where we feed grain to animals rather than uh, having them feed grass, um, grain or soy, is in fact not producing more food, it's producing less food. So in the United States we feed an immense amount of grain, we have a huge grain crop, we're an enormous grain producer, um, and about 70% of that grain is fed to animals. Uh, and when we do that, on average we get back uh, one pound of meat protein for every six pounds of feed protein. Uh, the, the, the cows are the worst in terms of this. It's more like one in 20 that we get back for grain-fed beef. Chickens, it's maybe one in three. Um, but in all of them, uh, we get back less than we put into them. Um, it's interesting, there's been a lot of discussion just recently um, about Russia's blockade of Ukraine's wheat ports of its wheat exports. Now, I'm, I'm the last person to say anything positive about Russia's aggression and invasion of Ukraine and the various atrocities that have been committed in Ukraine. But one thing I can say is it's somewhat hypocritical of American statespeople to say Russia is starving the world by blockading Ukrainian grain because the amount of grain that Ukraine produces, even if Russia succeeded in blockading all of Ukraine's grain crop and none of it got to feed the rest of the world, um, that would be much less, I think, I, about um, a sixth or something like that, I think, I can't remember the exact figure, but far less than what we could make available if we stopped feeding grain to animals um, and only ate the, the equivalent food value to the meat we're producing. And if we exported the rest of that grain, it would be far more than Ukraine would be able to produce. So it's an extremely wasteful process. And another way of looking at that is by asking how much protein can you produce, usable protein for humans, can you produce per acre with different kinds of ways of producing food. And this is a, uh, a USDA um, Food and Agriculture Organization, World Health Organization, etc., joint study um, which looks at this issue. And so what you have here is the pounds of usable protein you can produce per acre. Um, and here are the different ways of producing it. And you see that soybeans is way up the top um, in terms of the greatest amount of usable protein. And then other grains that you wouldn't even really think of as ways of producing protein um, rather than calories uh, um, still figure a lot better than all of the animal products, rice, corn, uh, legumes other than soybean, wheat, and it's only down here that we get to the animal products. So this column is milk, eggs, um, all meat averaged out, and beef there, you get the least amount. So um, in terms of feeding the world, um, we are doing exactly the wrong thing in feeding these crops. Well, we don't feed so much rice, but soy, corn, and wheat, uh, we're feeding to, to animals, um, and we're wasting uh, that amount of the food value. So um, that's it for me for this one. So we have some time for, uh, for questions and discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.
We'll start with questions uh, on site. He has, we just have a slight uh, technical problem where we can't access this question. Uh, I'm trying to try and get access to that. Uh, it was on the live chat forum, but if we don't get uh, that question, I'll try to ask it from whatever keywords I remember. I think we have a question from professors. I have a question, <laughs> if I may. Um, it, it's interesting that you have, uh, in your book, you take what might be called a minimalist kind of approach um, to the question because you want it to be non-controvertible that animals feel pain and therefore we should not inflict suffering upon them. It's intriguing that looking at one of your earlier slides, you had the whole list of things that theoretically have differentiated human beings from, from non-human animals. And it's very interesting if you look at the work of people like Carl Safina, uh, Franz de Waal, you've written about this yourself, that, that that whole list really can be replicated in terms of animals having culture, um, animals having kind of language, animals communicating with each other, uh, showing signs of altruistic behavior and so on. And I'm wondering if, if we were to take a more maximalist approach to the way we treat animals. Carl Safina says, for example, that the real question when you're looking at an animal is not what is it, but rather who are you. Um, what, would that, what would that do for us, particularly in light of the fact that we are treating human beings in increasingly non-humane <laughs> ways, perhaps? Yeah. Um, sorry, uh, you're, you're quite right that I'm deliberately taking a stance that is non-controversial or that is harder to contest. Um, I didn't want to say anything that some people would say, well, you know, uh, singers exaggerating the capacities of animals to do these things and, uh, you, you know, you can't, you can't prove that. So I wanted to stick to Grand that was, I thought, pretty hard to deny. Now, um, one place where I have not, do not done that is um, I joined with an Italian thinker and animal activist called Paola Cavalieri some years ago to um, edit a collection of articles uh, under the title The Great Ape Project. Uh, and the idea of The Great Ape Project, which was originally Paola's, but I was happy to participate, um, is that at the moment we think that there is this enormous gulf between humans and animals. So there's all uh, humans over here and then there's all animals sort of lumped together as different from us and we imagine that there is this wide gulf between us and animals. Whereas in reality, of course, the great apes are, are close relatives in evolutionary terms. Um, a chimpanzee is much closer to a human being than it is to a dog uh, um, and uh, Paola's idea was that we should try to bridge this gulf by um, talking about great apes, getting people, we have people like Jane Goodall and uh, uh, Baruta Galdikas, uh, experts who've studied great apes in the wild and a lot of other people like uh, who've, who've studied them in, uh, uh, in captivity or in uh, research. Uh, and um, recognize that they are rational, that they, are, that they make choices, um, that they do communicate with each other, and in fact that they can even learn a human language, uh, ASL, a sign language, um, uh, that they can communicate uh, with that, um, that they do plan ahead in various ways. Uh, and so the idea was that we would try to close that gap and get more people to realize that there's a continuum um, and we are close to some animals, not, not as close to other animals. Um, and, and now, since then even, because um, that book was published 30 years ago, there's been a lot more research, as you say, Cal Safina and many others, um, showing that even animals who are less close to us genetically uh, do have thoughts of their own and do um, communicate with each other in various ways uh, and can't be dismissed as... Um, beings who do not have any uh, degree of rationality. Um, so I think, you know, now we might be in a better position to make that argument that you're referring to, the maximalist argument, to really draw on the research that shows m more of these abilities to animals. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. The question is, would you be able to persuade people? And in particular, would you be able to persuade them about the animals they eat? Um, 
And there's some interesting psychology research, which I think I also mention in uh, Animal Liberation now, um, which suggests that people's attitudes to animals are affected by the knowledge that they eat them. So in, in this study, uh, so a couple of psychologists asked um, students from the university that they're at to, to volunteer for a study, as, as people do. The uh, students did not know what the purpose of the study was. <coughs> and when they came in, they were asked a lot of different questions, but the questions included things like, that showed you know, what they thought of the abilities of uh, cows in particular, you know, what they thought about their <coughs> intelligence or sensitivity, awareness of their surroundings and so on. Um, and then um, as the questions went on at some point it was close to lunchtime, so uh, some people were told that they were going to get a, a beef hamburger for lunch and other people were told that they were going to get some uh, plant-based meal. Um, and then they said, oh look, we've, we, we messed up some of the questions and we want you to answer this section of the questions again. And this section was a question about cows. And in fact, there was a difference. So the people who were going to get the plant-based meal did not change their views about cows. The people who were going to get the hamburger changed their views about cows in ways that were more negative for the capacities of cows. So, you know, we humans are also complex creatures and uh, thinking is not as rational as you would like it to be and it's influenced by the fact that we eat animals. So getting to persuade people about the capacities of cows and pigs and chickens is still something of a struggle. Hi. Um, I just want to speak to that really quickly. I would uh, highly recommend, um, and we don't need a lot of money for studies or uh, quantitative data here. If anybody here would be interested in coming to um, a sanctuary where you actually get to spend time with these farmed animals in their natural environment, that they're with their families, it, is, it can be very life-changing. So um, I think we found it to be very successful in our activism <coughs> that it can really be very persuasive for people just to um, actually place a face um, to the food that they're eating and spend some time with them. You'll see they're really a lot, they're like us in so many ways. And uh, if anyone's interested in that here, um, I can certainly help to set up sanctuary visit or make recommendations where um, we just ask you to open your heart and mind and maybe just go interact with these these beings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, it, it is wonderful to go to some of these sanctuaries. Um, I went to uh, one run by the organization that is called Farm Sanctuary um, a few years ago uh, and it was really interesting to see in particular the, these animals of the, the breeds that are raised in order to eat and therefore are killed young and to see them actually allowed to grow old which is not something that normally happens to them um, but also as, as you say to spend time with them and appreciate their personalities um, yeah it takes time to do that I have a question but uh, I read it before the break but it's not no longer available it's from Dr. Robert, Robert Tappan I think he teaches bioethics and um, animal rights at Towson University. I don't recall the question 100%, but the key words that I do remember was, could you ask Dr. Singer about laboratory-produced chickens or the latest research around that? Um, yeah. Um, not only can I talk about the research, um, but uh, only about um, a month ago, six weeks ago, I actually had my the first chicken that I've eaten for uh, 50 years um, and, and that was because I was in Singapore which was the first country to permit uh, what the question was uh, laboratory bread, it's not actually laboratory bread now it's, but it is um, if you like cellularly raised in a bioreactor so the idea is you, you take cells from a chicken which you can do without killing the chicken and without harming the chicken just as 
You can take cells from yourself if you want to do a Ancestry.com or 23andMe test. Um, and these cells can then be cultivated um, in a kind of growth serum uh, and uh, grown on what's called a scaffolding. So they take the form of meat. Um, and uh, this was the chicken that I was eating, although I was eating it in Singapore, was produced in California by um, a company called Good Meat, which is a subsidiary of a company called Just. Um, Just Mayonnaise has been on the market shelves in America for a while. It's not a cellular product, but it is a plant-based mayonnaise. No. Um, so, uh, yeah, this, this kind of production does hold the potential to replace uh, meat, but at the moment it's really expensive still to produce it. So what I was eating in Singapore um, at a particular, there was only one restaurant that served it, um, and uh, it wasn't like you were eating uh, a breast or leg of chicken. It was a pasta dish which had s some pasta, some peas and beans, and some chicken pieces about that long, not very long, um, that were put in it as well. Um, personally, you know, I didn't think the chicken was very wonderful. I mean, I thought if, if they'd sliced mushrooms into the pasta dish instead of the chicken, it would have been at least as good, maybe better. Um, I was there with a colleague, a host, who'd hosted me at the National University of Singapore, um, and who was curious himself, and who does still eat chicken. He said, yes, this does taste pretty much like chicken. Um, although he actually said, it's a little bit on the dry side. It wasn't the best, juiciest chicken he'd ever eaten. Um, but it, it was chicken and it had that kind of somewhat fibrous uh, nature of, of chicken. Um, so, you know, look, it's, it's not something that I would want to eat. I've been a perfectly uh, happy uh, vegetarian and um, essentially vegan for uh, a while now. And I think that's a good diet and I think a healthier diet than a meat diet too. Um, but if there are some people who are going to be committed to eating meat and won't change, then um, maybe if this can come down in price and it can get a little better in taste, uh, it might be a solution to the problems that I've talked about, both problems of animal welfare, problems of environment, because it, it does, most studies suggest it produces far fewer greenhouse gases than um, the meat itself does. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I hope it develops. I'm glad that m uh, money and uh, investment is going into producing it. Uh, and I hope, as I say, it, it comes down in price significantly. While I have the mic, we just had one question coming in online. Uh, I think, by the way, I read Dr. Tappan's question is very similar to what I asked. Uh, this question is, what do you think about the Quran saying regarding the inspiration or even revelation that the bees receive according to the Quran and the language or the uh, speech of ants that the Quran mentioned. There's a verse that the uh, Solomon, the prophet, understands the speech of the ants being spoken. Uh -huh. Your thoughts on that, the question? <laughs> um, look, I, I'm not going to really do a commentary on the Quran when I'm uh, here with many people who know far more about it than I do. Um, um, so ants and bees do communicate in various ways, uh, whether we regard this as a speech or not. I, I mentioned the Wuggle Dance of the Bees, which is better known and better studied than communication of ants. Um, uh, ants do communicate with each other, though. Whether they communicate by chemical signals rather than by speech is not, is not really clear. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I think we may learn more. I don't know whether it's particularly about bees or ants, but there is work going on in using AI to communicate with animals. Um, so the AI can perhaps understand the vocalizations of animals um, better. It you know, can take a huge database and uh, correlate that with the behavior that indicated what the animal was wanting to express. Um, and already I think that, you know, the, commercial, the, the immediate commercial applications of this are going to be from uh, dog and cat owners. Um, if AI can actually translate for them what the dog wants. Now, a lot of dog owners that I've spoken to about this say, oh, I know what my dog wants. I know this particular um, you know, bark means uh, I want to go for a walk. That bark means I'm hungry um, and, and so on. 
uh, this bark means you know I need to um, do something. Um, better take me for a walk for that reason. Um, so you know, yeah. But but maybe AI will be able to do this better, and maybe it will be able to do it for animals who are not our companions, and so we haven't learned to read their uh, their sounds and their bodily movements or expressions as well as we have with the companion animals. So um, I think it's an interesting area of trying to understand animal speech better than we can so far. Um, an observation and, and also a question to follow up on what you said about the, the uh, fish farms. My wife and I were in Norway over the summer and had the opportunity to see some of these. And my understanding is that a lot of these large producers of fish in Norway simply refer to it as, them as biomass. Um, they're not even individual animals. It's just this sort of collective <laughs> marketable thing. Another thing is that they, they feed them largely soy products, um, which does all kinds of things to the wonderful omegas, threes, and sixes that we, uh, we like to talk about so much. And third, they inbreed them in such a way that they produce what they are calling frankenfish uh, that have all kinds of genetic problems because of they're so genetically limited. Um, a question I would have is, is the way that we are treating, it's a secondary question in your book, but how the way we treat animals bounces back in the way we treat human beings. Um, you think about the maximization of profit in the medical, medical industry, and we actually use that terminology to describe that. Could you, could you speak to that? Uh, yes. Um, certainly, I think that uh, a lot of what we do to animals is harmful to ourselves in a variety of ways. I mean, as I've already mentioned, I think it, to have such abundant cheap meat is not good for the health of the population. Um, yeah, you know, I don't deny that we were originally omnivores, um, but we never ate as much meat as we eat now, um, and I'm sure that's related to cancers of the digestive system and heart disease and, you know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not a medical expert either, but I can read reports. The, the Lancet, which is one of the world's l top two medical journals, published a big study um, about uh, the effect of eating large quantities of meat, um, both on the environment of the planet and on the health of people as well. So I think that's certainly clear. In the medical research area, what we have now is this very large industry, um, which includes scientists, of course, who have built their careers experimenting on animals, plus um, the companies that are selling and breeding and selling animals for laboratory research. Which, uh, Charles River Breeding is, is one of these very large companies. And they are forming a highly effective lobby group um, to continue to promote the use of animals in science, um, even though there is a lot of evidence that um, at least a large part, I'm not going to say all, but a large part of this is not useful for humans. Um, that, uh, um, in fact, the results do not translate. We have lots of, lots of studies showing that this drug will cure cancer in mice. You try it on humans, it doesn't work. Um, so a lot of this research is quite misleading. Um, but it's very hard to get rid of it. Um, I mentioned earlier that the United States does not count the numbers of uh, birds and rodents used in research. Why is that? Well, it goes back quite a long way. Um, initially, the legislation did mandate the U USDA to regulate animal research, but the USDA didn't do it. It only covered these limited numbers of species, the uh, um, dogs and cats and primates and a couple of others, um, because it said it didn't have the resources to cover all of the others. And then a group of animal organizations went to court and said, you are not complying with the law. Um, and, and the animal groups won, and the court said, you have to comply with the law. So what, did, what happened? Did Congress then give the USDA enough money to comply with the law? No. Instead, the lobbyists got active and they said, you need to pass an amendment to the law specifically saying that it's only these species that USDA has the power to regulate. And that's what happened. I mean, they got that amendment through, which is really incredible when you think that it's legislation to regulate animal experimentation. And it 
is deliberately amended to exempt at least 95% of the animals experimented on. And none of the other countries that we like to compare ourselves with um, in terms of standards of animal welfare, whether it's the European countries, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, um, none of them uh, don't regulate rodents as part of their work. So it's a, it's a very powerful lobby and it's a lobby that is harming animals and harming humans together. <clears throat> Dr. Singer, what are your thoughts, because um, animal welfare and liberation also pertain to the animals that are in captivity for uh, entertainment and clothing. Do you have any, um, what are your thoughts on that, yeah. sir? Uh, well, obviously, I do not, particularly I do not approve of animals in captivity for clothing. I mean, a lot of them are fur-bearing animals. Um, and again, uh, no, I focused on, on what we eat. Um, but uh, mink, for example, are kept in small wire cages um, where they can't really move around. And these are wild animals who would naturally move a lot. Uh, uh, fox and others are also um, raised in these cages. Uh, so I think this is an awful industry and um, I think it should be stopped. Uh, again, the Europeans may be moving to stop it. They, they, the European Commission said that it was planning to prohibit cages for animals, um, like including the fur industry. Um, and I hope it will still do that. Um, but one thing I will say that I, uh, some activists in the animal movement have been breaking into fur farms at night and releasing uh, the animals, including mink. Um, I do not support that. Um, I don't support it because it's actually neither good for the wild animals where the mink are released because mink are predators and they will kill uh, as much as they can because they need to eat. Um, and it's not good for the mink because there won't be enough wild animals for them to eat and the great majority of them will starve to death. So, um, uh, you know, I, I understand and admire the activists' concern about how awful fur farming is, but I um, don't approve of those tactics. Um, in terms of animals for entertainment, um, I'm not sure whether you still have touring circuses in the US that use animals other than horses maybe. Um, we, when I was in Australia in the 80s and 90s, uh, we had a campaign which essentially succeeded in um, shutting down or, or persuading circuses to stop using non-domestic animals. You know, they used to have these uh, uh, lions and tigers that um, were supposed to have been tamed um, and they would leap around the ring and then the rest of their lives they would spend in these small cages in uh, basically in trucks that were to take them to the next town to visit. Um, that seems to have stopped fortunately here and I'm, I, I don't, do you know if it exists in the US? Um, are there still circuses touring with wild animals? Mm -hmm. But there are still some, there are still some that are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Um, well, I, you know, I think that is, is really awful. Um, with zoos, uh, there is, I mean, I think so, there's been a movement to give animals more space and somewhat more natural conditions. Um, certainly not ideal. But there is the question of, of what can you do with animals who have been bred in captivity. You can't actually release them to the wild. They've lost the skills that they had. Um, and sometimes, in fact, the habitat that they had is g gone, just uh, developed. So it's it's really quite difficult. You could stop them, stop them breeding, and then they would not be there at all. Um, there's an argument that zoos that actually show animals in reasonably natural conditions encourage people to be the visitors to be conservationist um, and to be more concerned about protecting the habitat of these animals who they've seen. I haven't seen a lot of good studies as to whether that actually works, um, but that I think would be relevant as to whether the zoos that treat animals better than others um, should be allowed to continue. Uh, Maybe yes, we'll take this as the last question. Oh, you're getting the last one in, okay. Thank you very much for everything. that You, you really have inspired and strengthened my resolve to be able to speak like you do in a calm way about all these issues. And I was farm raised in Huntington County, so 
with a small dairy farm, but I've since changed tremendously. There are wonderful vis uh, videos on YouTube of elephant sanctuaries and other sanctuaries that have uh, animal activists have, uh, you know, looked at uh, zoos and animals in captivity, and then uh, philanthropists have donated land. There's one in in Georgia. There's various parts in the Far East, like in Thailand, animal sanctuaries, elephant sanctuaries, where elephants have been in abominable circumstances, not moving in spaces, you know, for decades that are gradually introduced to the wild. And they're able to, you know, live out the rest of their lives on these sanctuaries uh, that are bordered by fences, of course, but there's enough space for them to get back into nature. So uh, you can always look at those and see what hope there is for certain animals that have been in zoos. Thank you very much. That's uh, a really encouraging note to end on, and I hope we can continue to do that, and of course also try to stop reducing the habitat uh, of these animals, which particularly with Asian elephants has been a major problem, that there's constant encroachment on their habitats, um, and then they get into conflicts with humans, with villagers in the areas, and um, it's not a good outcome. So I think yeah, we, we need to protect that space and uh, allow them to live their lives. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you to Dr. Singer. He's been standing for now more than two hours, I believe, um, explaining to us something that pretty much comes down to human greed and the aggressive market forces. And again, as we noted, that perhaps as Australians, we find it there's market greed to be even much, much stronger here in America. We find that a bit shocking. For some of the students here at Respect, you might have heard about biomass being referred to. Many of the students who come here to seek a master's degree in Islamic studies, they always usually think of the hadith, the saying of the Prophet that seek knowledge for whoever seeks a path to seek knowledge, even the fish in the oceans make prayer for you. So they can't be praying for you if they're being treated as biomass and killed like that. Uh, thank you very much everyone. We will have an opportunity now perhaps for uh, to do some book signing. Uh, Dr. Peterson can be seated while he does that. Um, and yeah, we can just continue the discussions online, I mean online, uh, but also over tea and coffee. Um, thank you again. Thank you.